Oh yeah. Hello, hello, hello. College football. We are in full effect right now. How, how fun is football? How great is ball, man? I've called some good ones. Been on the road all season long. Just got back from Arizona State. They beat Washington State. Final play of the game, Jaden Daniels. It was, it was simply special. And also special is the support that all of you have given me and our team, our producer Pete Garrison and myself, as this podcast has continued to grow. Uh, I love hearing about it on the road. It comes up pretty often, so thank you for the support. If you can, continue to subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends. As wacky as it sounds, every article I read says, the more reviews, the better. So um, even if it's a few minutes, if you feel it, if the spirit of the podcast world moves you, drop a note in if you can. That being said, today's conversation, I think, will impact you in a cool way because it impacted me. It's a live event, and I'm starting to do more of these live events. So if you can think of one that you're interested in or you want me to bring somebody on live at your school, in your office, um, at your business, whatever it is, let us know. Uh, just hit me up on social media at Yogi Roth because this one was fun. I partnered with a company called Thuzio to do events in Los Angeles from time to time. This one's a blast because it's with Antonio Gates. Uh, Antonio Gates is a lock to be a Hall of Famer. He's an eight-time Pro Bowler. He's five-time All-Pro. He's big time. I don't know if he's going to ever play again. He's still a free agent as a tight end. He played for the San Diego Chargers and the LA Chargers. But his story is amazing. I think we all knew about him as an athlete, you know. but I don't think we knew the why behind him not playing college football. And I think it's really special. I remember when I was in college at Pitt, and you heard about him getting drafted. I can remember some of the guys that I played with. They were basketball players like Chevy Troutman. That's an old school name who got tryouts in the NFL. And you know, obviously Tony Gonzalez is, is the, the best of all best in terms of playing football and basketball. But he began a big trend in terms of athletes who didn't play college football still getting shots to play in the National Football League because of their athleticism. And I love that because I think being a two-sport athlete is huge. And I think for all the parents out there, and I hear from you a lot, don't specialize in one sport unless that's all your kid wants to do because burnout, all the tests have shown us. It's a great study by the Aspen Institute. Uh, we'll link in the show notes that really showcase that burnout's real. And so the more you can play everything, the better athlete, the better hand-eye coordination, the better competitive temperament that you learn in other environments, the better you're going to be in whatever it is that you hope to master. So I think you'll love this. And I also think you'll love the partner that I have on my podcast, Kona Red coffee. I, I love coffee. And I gotta be honest, I wasn't a coffee guy until I got older. And now if you come into my house now, my wife and I is always brewing Kona Red. She loves the coffee beans. I love the cold brew in a can. Check it out at KonaRed.com. And it comes from Hawaii. And I love Hawaii. Who, who, hey, who doesn't love Hawaii? But if you know about coffee, you love Hawaii even more because of their nutrient rich soil. Because every coffee cherry is handpicked at peak ripeness so they got it all cold brew they even have a juice a hawaiian cascara juice they have the coffee in a can sam darnold he loves drinking that for the new york jets he's a part of this company as i am and i'm really proud to have them as a partner of this podcast and we're going to be doing some more events as well so we'll make sure that we keep you posted in our newsletter if you missed anything on the newsletter just subscribe at yogiroth.com so check out kona red find them at vons albertson's pavilions ralph's bristol Farms, Sprouts. I see it at Whole Foods when I'm traveling around the Pac-12 footprint as well. So check it out. I love it. It's a catalyst to conversation. And sit back if you're in the morning and you need a little pick-me-up, sit back and have a little cup of coffee because you're going to enjoy this conversation live with Antonio Gates. All right. Well, we wanted to make it feel like a basketball game. That's why we packed it in right. like this. It feels just like yes. you were playing high school basketball yeah. in Detroit, yes. right? Well, college too. Kent State was kind of small. so Yeah. I like it. I like it. Well, Antonio, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, these events are really fun. And like we talked about earlier, ideally when we have these conversations, we're hoping that you guys can take something away to your businesses, to your families, to your kids, something along those lines. So I want to begin with something a little different. Um, I'm obsessed with the word wonder. And the wonderment that athletes have sometimes. We're laying in our bed at night. We're looking up and we're wondering about what we're going to do in our life. And we're utilizing and tapping into our imagination. You have one of the most, if not the most career, most unique careers in the National Football League. So I'm curious, as a kid in Detroit, mm -hmm. what was your wonderment like in your imagination? Well, you know, it was uh, trying to uh, exceed expectations for the most part. Uh, you know, growing up in Detroit was uh, a challenge for any inner city kid. And uh, trying to set the example, uh, 
uh, I think I was the oldest of five. So when you're the oldest, you know, generally you, you know, you kind of set the rules, you know, you set the standard. And I had a sister, she passed away, she had lupus. So I think some of those things were uh, a driving force for me. And I think every night when I didn't feel like getting up or I didn't feel like going to practice, uh, I think my environment, uh, my family, and most importantly, my little sister was something that I, you know, I used as a tool to continue to push me. And uh, sometimes you can't push yourself. You get to a point where you, it's kind of like running a mile. You go out there and you're just trying to work out. And then all of a sudden you give up. And, you know, you got a trainer. He pushes you through it. That was kind of like my situation, my story. My family always was like the motivation factor to get through everything that I had to get through. And that's why I've always wanted to be the best. How old were you when your sister passed away? 34. Yep, I was 34 when she passed away. It's, it's amazing for me because she passed away so late in your mm. career. Mm -hmm. Was that a driving force for you since you mm -hmm. were a child and started to fall in love with sport? Well, she's, she's had lupus for a while. So that she, I always seen the struggle. And um, more importantly, I seen the struggle with my family. And uh, I think that itself uh, is just the biggest force that you, you can have. For any human being, it's your family, your friends, the ones you love. And I think for me, it was always about them. It was always about I wanted them to have a better life than I had. I wanted them to grow up different than I, I grew up. And I was able to accomplish some of those things through the game of football, luckily. Football. Mm -hmm. Interesting that you say that. You read about you. You watch different elements about you throughout your life. Everything reflects back on this amazing love for hoops. Mm. What, what about basketball? And give us some insight into those that may not have played it, allowed you to have an inner dialogue with yourself to build up the grit that allowed you to eventually transfer it over to the gridiron. Man, you know, <laughs> this is probably the most asked question because I, I love the game of basketball. I, you know, it, it was unfortunate. I, to me, I, you know, it didn't matter what you decide in your life, God trumps everything. That To me, that's the end of the story. So I, I wanted to play basketball, and I went to school to play basketball. And uh, football was, uh, I use this analogy where most men would understand. It's like going to the prom, and you got two girls you got to choose from, and one wants you, and you want the other. And that was kind of like how basketball was for me. I wanted basketball, but football loved me so much. I was like, well, that's the one I'm going to go with. So, uh, and that's how it ended up being for me. So, uh. That's classic. I think what was, was really interesting when reading about you is when you go to Michigan State, you're going to go play for Nick Saban. They got a basketball coach in Tom Izzo. These are two of the most historically successful coaches at their respective craft. What drew you to that place? And then what inside yourself? Again, that inner dialogue that athletes, that all of us feel at some point in our lives. What allowed you to say, I, I got to make a move? Because you made it relatively early in your mm -hmm. collegiate career. Well, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you have two voices. You have your mind and you have your heart. And, um, uh, you know, basketball was definitely my heart. So uh, I tried it, and then uh, as I got older, and as I started realizing, uh, a lot of people are doing plan B, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you have plan A is what you love and what you want to do and what you drive and strive for, and then you have plan B, what, you know, realistically settles in. And I think that's how I felt. I started making those choices uh, in terms of uh, I have to do what's right as a man. You know, and I, you know, so football was giving me an opportunity to make money um, for my family. And uh, it was, you know, for the most part, a shoe in. Uh, like I said, they, they loved everything about me. They loved my size. They loved my speed. Uh, basketball was more, they always wanted to see me do it again. They always wanted to see me do more. They always wanted to see next opponent. They always wanted to see a bigger opponent. And I was like, wait a minute now. Nah. I'm averaging 20 points a game. <laughs> so that's how it turned out. So that's interesting. So plan A was? To play basketball. To play basketball. Plan B was to play football. Mm -hmm. You go to school A, mm -hmm. first school, to play both. Mm -hmm. Doesn't go down for a variety of reasons. You find yourself in junior college. When did you make the decision on, okay, I'm going to go chase basketball, and I'm going to go do this, versus maybe the sport that size-wise, projection-wise, mm -hmm. even coming out of high school, was the one that could make you the quote unquote, as you just said, the most money. My happiness was important too. 
at the time. I was 17 when I went to college. So my happiness at that point was everything for me. And um, I spent so much time, you know, you know, I had countless of hours in the gym playing basketball, man. So, I, you know, you don't really give up when you have that type of, you know, impact in terms of how much I put into the game. So I wanted to see how it went. And it's like uh, the game of life is the game of sports. In my opinion, you adapt as you go along. Like the first kind of quarter of my life, I was like, doing well, and then it started getting rocky with the game of basketball. So I started making adjustments that was necessary, and um, that's like sports. I relay everything to sports in my life. Uh, that's kind of what I did. Uh, the ones who, in my opinion, uh, has the most success is the ones that's able and have the ability to adapt, and that's just what I did. Where did you learn or, or who guided you towards the idea of, I got I to gotta do what makes me happy? You know, I, I think it's just more of a, I mean, I'm not big on religion. I, I have a spiritual, like, I'm more spiritual. So I just think when I would do something, I just know if it felt right. I, you know what I mean? I was the oldest. Keep in mind, I was the oldest. So I had to kind of go through the trials and tribulations and bump my head all the time. I had a shoot, man, I'm rehabilitated. You know, so, you know, I went through a lot. And then all of a sudden, uh, what felt right always played a major factor in my choices, what felt right. Sometimes I couldn't see it. It was cloudy. My vision was always cloudy for the most part. But if I couldn't see it and it was cloudy, I tried to go off how I felt, what was the right decision to make. And I, it, it turned out to be great. I don't know about you, but I, I grew up playing basketball as well. And I always remember the basketball court was where I figured out all of life's problems. Because mm -hmm. it was just me yeah. and a hoop. Yeah, yeah. For you, was, was that the place where you sought refuge and where you could mm -hmm. go to figure out, okay, maybe I got to – Give football a shot. Go to Michigan State. Not nah, my heart saying this. Go to College Sequoias. Mm -hmm. Just be a Hooper. Well, for the most part, uh, I had uh, like a soundboard, if you will, where I seen guys who I played against, and I seen what they were able to do. I got friends that went to the NBA, and I got friends that went to the NFL. So when I put myself in that category, I say, well, what about my friends that went to the NFL? How did they career? How did they life turn out? And what about my friends that went to the NBA? Uh, when I would watch the guys that I would, quote, unquote, you know, in the same class of talent with, the ones in the NBA tend to always um, was on the fence, if you will. So they were always, you know, going from team to team, 10-day contracts. You know, I'm like, dude, that ain't going to work. You know what I'm saying? And the friends in football were more like, you know, high draft picks, you know, getting the big contracts and, uh, you know, doing the right thing. So that's, uh, you know, I tried to make my decision based on some of those elements. And, I, you know, like I said, I, I, you know, it turned out great for me. I think that's just amazing because you, you're talking about the decision to go play football, but you went to college to play hoops. Mm -hmm. You could have easily said, I'm going to go get in a couple years as a tight end, mm -hmm. somewhere in the West Coast, wherever mm -hmm. you wanted to go. How come you still stayed with hoops even though it seemed as though you knew you were eventually going to potentially go back to football? Well, uh, this, this thing is uh, the uncertainty. Uh, they, you know, the, the NFL teams were so intrigued with my ability to move at my size. I, I, um, I wanted them to continue to imagine that. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't want to go play, and then they say, oh, this guy can't play. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'd rather you'd imagine something than actually have a – you know what I mean? Saying, oh, he can't do this. So that's why I didn't play football. I said to myself, I said, I'm a part of something special. I was a captain in basketball. So I just felt like that was more important. And then football was still, you know, a big part of, you know, my recruiting process. So I said to myself, it didn't make no sense to go out and play for Kent State where they can now, you know, have their checklist and say this is what he can and can't do. Uh, the unknown, what was that was the uh, the most intriguing part about me is because they couldn't really get a finger, get you know, get an idea of what I would be like on the next level. So I said, I just use it to my advantage. I, you know, I said, Nah, man, I ain't I ain't gonna play. Y'all gonna have to pay me to play. You know, so then that's what happened. Wow. Well, you know, Nick just said I got married. I was in Bali, and a lot of people in Bali make money helping people predict the future. I think you could totally be like a healer right now if no, you wanted no. to go over there. <laughs> And help people figure it out. I mean, the the, the vision of that is, is next level. I've never heard anything like that. You didn't play a snap mm -hmm. in college, and you were like, 
NFL scouts are going to fall in love with me. And there wasn't anybody that did what you did. Mm. After you, everybody who's six foot six played college basketball, power forward, mm -hmm. are trying out as a tight end in the league. So with that being said, when you organized your tryout, your pro day for the league, I feel like you knew you had an ace in your back pocket. What, what was that experience like? Yeah, I, I mean, it was like having to draw a four card in Uno, man. It was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, like I said, man, I just, I never wanted them to have a true understanding of what I can and couldn't do. And um, for the most part, uh, you know, I knew I can, like, run and jump. And I let them, like anything, you put your best foot forward. And that's kind of what I did. I was like, look, all they got to do is come see me run and jump, and then I'll be good. You know, like anybody, any human being, you put your best foot forward. And uh, like I said, man, I'm blessed, I, you know. So that ended up working out. I'd like to say so, yeah. It ended up, you, you did all right for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did all right. Um, the transition, though, uh, putting pads on, getting going. You could run. You could jump, as you said. Was it, was it hard? Was it more challenging than you thought? Was the mentality from a basketball floor to the gridiron, was it totally different? Or did you feel as though you were preparing yourself when you were an undrafted free agent? Yeah, well, that, that part was more challenging. Uh, you know, to see guys at that size, 280, 300 pounds moving the way they were moving. Uh, you know, I was accustomed to playing against taller players, but they were a lot smaller, thinner. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was... I was blown away by the ability of some of the football players that I had a pleasure to play against and play with. Um, but I think my mentality, which allowed me to be uh, the player that I, you know, I became, is that you know I control what I can control, which was my hard work, my effort, uh, my mental toughness. Those are the things that I was able to control. So uh, you know, I just came out every single day to get better. Uh, you know, I didn't worry about what everybody else was going was doing. I didn't worry about the stigma of what a good tight end was like, what this tight end played like. I said, look, this is who I am, and I stuck to myself. I was true to myself, and then that became a pattern, you know what I mean? So then all of a sudden, I look up, and they were saying, just be yourself, and it, and it worked out. Yeah, I I'd like to think you'd agree football is the ultimate team game. Absolutely. Every snap, you've got to do your deal. But you come from a family where boxing mm -hmm. was important, where you're on your own, where you can oh, yeah. you literally, as you just said, yeah. take care of yourself. Did that play into effect at all in terms of your mindset when you entered training camp in San Diego? It did. I mean, I did your research too, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it did. Boxing was a big part of my family. Uh, but I think the environment probably uh, – had more of an impact than anything. I think growing up uh, where, uh, as an inner city kid, just having to overcome certain things, uh, violence, uh, drugs, you know, so many stipulations you have to overcome. And I think that, you know, when I would get here and I, when I got to San Diego, uh, I would see, you know, quote unquote guys complaining a lot. That's what we say in the locker room. That's a term we use. But from where I'm from, it was an opportunity that need to be met, and I think I use that as motivation. If you were going to complain, then you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong profession. I, you know, I was that kind of player. I was like, look, man, I ain't got time to complain. I got to make it happen. If you're trying, you're probably failing. You know, that was like a rule in the locker room, and, and that's what I – I think that's why I was able to prevail this long and overcome certain things because I was always, you know, controlling what I can control, and I, I had the mental toughness coming from the inner city in Detroit. Could you tell, because if you talk to anybody who you played with or works in the organization, they'd say that you had a gravitational pull towards mm -hmm. yourself in the locker room. Obviously now as a veteran, but a lot of people say you even had that early on. Mm -hmm. Could you tell that you had that? Were people drawn to your no flinch approach, no whining, no complaining, mm -hmm. no excuses? Not, you, know, you know what, not really. I didn't. What I, what I tried to do is I, I tried to treat everybody the same. And I think uh, for the most part, when you establish yourself in anything you do, uh, football, business, once you reach a certain level, you tend to, you know, treat people who's lower different. And it's the second nature. It's not a knock against them. I always, I, grew, I came in as a free agent. So my, my thing was that I wanted to impact the ones who um, reminded me of myself. 
and obviously I was, a, you know, all pro at the time, but I would have conversations with guys who probably never get in the game uh, just to let them know that their, their role is just as big, you know what I mean, in order for us to win a championship. Your role at that level is, even though it's minute, it still it helps us collectively as a team. So I think that's where uh, I excelled the most is just dealing with guys who didn't have, you know, so much of a major role but yet their role was minute, which is getting me ready. Your role could be getting me ready to go play a game. I appreciated that. So I think that's where you probably, you know, you get the, the feedback in terms of, you know, people gravitating towards me in the locker room. I got to ask, man, like how, how do you maintain and how have you maintained your humility, especially early in your career? Because you went from basketball player who the only person who knew that could play football was you to an all pro early in your career. You know, I, I always uh, I see growing up, we we blue collar man, Detroit man. So the auto industry, we work hard. We are about genuine people. We authentic. So we never, you know, we never ever, you know, cared about nothing else. I, we cared about good people, and I've always said this, even to my teammates. I would always tell them, "You'll be a human being a lot longer than you'll be a football player." So you remember that. You don't never know who you run across and who you treat a certain way. You never know, you might run back into them. And I, that's the philosophy that I've always taken, is that I, I'd be a human being a lot longer than I'd be a football player. When you hear your peers, and for any of us that have been around pros, whether at these events or been in a locker room, to hear pros talk about pros, to me, is really special. You, know, you give it great respect. To hear some of your teammates and people that you've played against talk about you, what's that like to listen to? I mean, that's why you play the game to get the respect from your peers and your teammates and things of that nature. And obviously it's, it's, it's humbling because you, you know, you go out and you work and, and you, you know, most of the time people see the surface. They don't know what's underneath the surface. I think those guys, they appreciate certain things that's getting done on Sundays because they understand the labor, the hard work that it has to put in, you have to put into it to get to that point. When you think back undrafted free agent. You, you said earlier, you knew you could play. Mm -hmm. Did you know you'd be setting records? Did you, did you have that in your back? But if you did, then that's like, yeah, no, that's not no, Uno. No, that's a game that hasn't no, existed no, no, yet. No, you, you know, I, I didn't know that. You know, it's, uh, you know, you know you can play. I think for the most part, you know, as humble as, you know, a person can be, you have to have a certain mindset to get to a certain level still. I, you know what I mean? You can't all of a sudden be the best and just think everybody's better than you. That doesn't work, you know. So, I mean, I feel, you know, pretty confident going into the games. And I got, I got a lot of trash talk. I'm a Gemini, so I got a lot of trash talking to me that's different than now than it is on Sunday. So, uh, I, you know, I had somewhat of a uh, successful first two or three years, and that builds confidence. I think, you know, you, you constantly get reinforced in the right way. It builds confidence. And then it gets to a point where I just felt – you know, at times unstoppable. And I put the work in to feel that way. It wasn't just like I woke up feeling that way. It, it's the, the miles. It's the, you know, the training. Uh, I think mentally you get there first. And then, you know, once you get there mentally, then sky's the limit. Sky was the limit for you. Prior to setting a record with touchdown catches, you knew that was there. What are the thoughts like as you enter the red zone? Mm -hmm. And you know you're about to be, not just in the history of, an organization, but in the history of the game, man, I know that breaking the record of a guy who also played hoops, mm -hmm. but in the Pac-10, mm -hmm. now Pac-12, in Tony G. Uh, what was that like prior to it, knowing it it was dangling in front of you? You know, it, shoot, man, it's it's unfortunate because I was so close to the fours, I, I hadn't really appreciated it as much. And you know, I know it, it might sound crazy, but I, I just felt like I had so much left in the tank, and uh, you know. Even last year when I played, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, I really don't see it that way. It's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm going, I got tunnel vision, and I'm running a race. And my race is not over. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Somebody asking you about a race that you don't, in your mind, you hadn't finished. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, I appreciate everything. I always was very thankful for things that people would say in a generosity way. But, I, you know, I was so close to it, I couldn't see it. You know, I just... Even now, maybe when I'm done playing and I retire and unfortunately one day I go in the Hall of Fame, I can appreciate that moment. But, uh, you know, I still had so much left that I was just constantly the next step, the next game, the next week. 
I, that was over. I celebrated. I enjoyed it the next week. I mean, that was my focus and that was my mindset all the time. So, um, like I talk, I, I talk a lot about basketball now, and I didn't do it when I played. I talk about how good I am now <laughs> in basketball, but I didn't do it when I played. So that's kind of how I feel. I just, I couldn't see it, man. I was so close to the forest, I couldn't see the trees. Well, we're gonna let you see it one more time. Let's roll that <laughs> clip of the great play that he made to set a new record. When you watch that, I'm curious, what are you watching? What do you see? Footsteps of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, like, my high school, college, pro, just all the things I've been through, all the hard work, countless hours, you know, the pain, suffering, it was worth that that one moment. Uh, and that's kind of how I see a glimpse of my whole life in the past and what everything I've been through to get to that point. When I watched it, uh, I saw your teammates. Mm -hmm. I saw the greatest sign of respect with them mm -hmm. sprinting. I'm sure some were coming off the sideline mm -hmm. to come yeah. find you. Yeah. When you're laying on the ground and guys are loving you like that, in a, in a historic moment, you, you uh -huh. knew that moment was coming, even mm -hmm. if you didn't want to give it a ton of shine. Mm -hmm. How is that? Take us inside the helmet there, because I don't think any of us, no offense, will ever experience breaking mm -hmm. the record in the NFL for touchdown receptions. You know, it became emotional, believe it or not, man. I, you know, that's... It's it's weird how things affect you in a different way without even knowing it would affect you that way. Uh, like you you alluded to, I, you know, the fact of the matter is that my teammates was just as happy for me than you know. What I mean? So, uh, it, it you know it became emotional for me because I'm thinking like, wow, I didn't. Even, I kept saying I didn't love this game. You know what I'm saying? And now I'm to the point where it's it's taught me so much. It gave you know it gave me the opportunity to meet so many you know some of these players, so many wonderful people across the world. I think that's the moment that I, um, I mean, that's how I felt at the time. Like, wow, I'm in a, a space of you know hard work and dedication. I'm at the top, the pinnacle of, of a position. Wow, I mean, I've done some you know phenomenal things along with being blessed along the way. At one point along the way, did football? become plan A in terms of the love that you had. Because to play professional anything, to do mm -hmm. our jobs, whatever they are, at a high level, you, you got to give it the agape love, man. Mm -hmm. You got to give it yeah. the deep stuff. Yeah, yeah. When did that change yeah. for you? Uh, you know, I really not, I'm not sure. I, I think I've always had a mentality of um, just trying to do my best and be my best, more so than it was to try to be the all-time leader. And I think by doing that, I became an all-time leader. Or, you know what I mean? And so that's the thing about me. I've always just wanted to push myself, get better every single year, I come back better every single year. Uh, and, it, you know, I use the term, it just, it's progression. It ain't perfection. For me, it was always progression. So, you know, in the midst of doing that, I was able to accomplish certain things. of just pushing myself. I had really, you know, my mind was not set on someone else's record or catching 113 touchdowns. I was just saying, you be the best Antonio Gates you can be, and wherever the chips may fall, then that's what they are. That's what they are. How do you deal with the word optimism? I mean, I've always felt that way. I've always been that way. Uh, that's, that symbolizes me. I always see the good in everything, in everything that I do. Uh, no matter what you might say, what someone might say about a person, you know what I mean, I feel like they can change. Because I've, I've witnessed it and I've experienced it myself, um, even when I would get hurt. And they say, you playing this week? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to go. I always felt like the glass was half full and half empty. And psychology would teach us that at the core of resiliency is optimism. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I was like, oh. It, wow. it makes a lot of things make sense now. Yes, you know, yeah. you resilient. You fight through all the things that you did, and of course, you're an optimist. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I have to be in order to you know accomplish some of the things that I've been able to accomplish. And uh, and you still need luck. I, I don't want to you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think that the guys that was around me, I, I had a great team, man. I, you know, I, I'm talking about myself, but I, I can't. I, I, there's so many people I would have to think to get to this point because I think for the most part it's one person that always get the glory but you know I mean it's the support and cast like a you know a family a, a, you know a team or anything you do it's the people that's around you that allow things to be take the burden to be taken off of you so you can focus on being the best that you can be 
was talking to somebody within your organization earlier, and they said that when Kobe came to speak to you guys over the last couple of seasons, you really leaned into that, and you really leaned into the mentorship part of your role mm -hmm. at that time on, on the team. Who and how do you learn from others, and how have you applied that to your new role as a vet over the mm -hmm. last few seasons? Well, I mean, it's so many different ways. I've always felt like a great leader is a great listener. And uh, even now, with this whole idea of whether or not I'm going to come back or not, retire or not, uh, everything is fairly new because I've always had tunnel vision. I wanted to be the best I can be. So, I, you know, what I try to do is I try to, like, grasp information from people. You know, people stop me at the gas station, man, and tell me stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so about sports all the time. And I listen to what they got to say, not, you know, just because you never know what you can learn from a person. You know, so I've always felt like a good listener was a good leader. And I've always tried to listen and and learn from certain people mistakes, uh, you know, and, and whether or not it was a snake or not, you know, just learn from them and then use it to my advantage. You know, everyone in here or listening to this conversation is – a high performer, and we mm -hmm. all have to focus a great deal, but anybody can focus. The skill is refocus. Mm -hmm. How have you trained yourself to be able to refocus and refocus and refocus to play for so long? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to do it for two years. 3.3 .3 is the average career in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Safe to say you've multiplied that a few times. Yeah, yeah uh, more than a few times. So, so how have yeah. you done that? You know, every year I try, you know... I, and excuse me if I'm using terms because I've been in a locker room for so long. So I, we use this term called reboot. And I like the, like a computer. It's like anything. You, you start feeling a certain kind of way, you reboot. You start from scratch. And I like to treat every year like it was my first. I remember when I got into the league, like anybody, when you get into a, you know, any type of situation you get into, your first year, you, you're trying to impress everyone. And I try to get to that point. Whether or not I get there or not, that's my goal. Every year. I vacation, I relax, I reboot my system. That's what I'm doing. I'm rebooting my system. I'm getting away from the game of football. When I come back, it's like this is a new team, this is a new year. I got something to prove. And I think you start tallying years up together like that, and, you know, those are what you call, you know, Hall of Famers. Those are what you, you know, to me, that's, where I, that's, where I, that's what I've always tried to do. To prove your words. Mm -hmm. To prove others wrong, to prove yourself right. A mix, a blend, has it transferred over? Is it one or the other? It just depends on, for me, it was always uh, any motivation that I needed if I couldn't motivate myself. Uh, for me, I was always able to motivate myself, but I have said things to my teammates that, uh, you know, if you can't motivate yourself, find something that can. And sometimes that's all it takes, something to motivate you. Uh, I was very fortunate to have... Uh, I'm an unorthodox thinker, uh, so I've always motivated myself. And it always been in some small little, you know, something somebody may say at the end of the year, you're too old, man. You, why are you still playing, man? You know, I remember what, I seen a sign. I, I think it might have been in Oakland, most likely. I seen a sign, and it was like, yeah, my grandma's, you know, available for dating. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I just use whatever I can to motivate me to keep moving, and I just use it. And I try to help it, you know, use it to make me a better person. Speaking of motivation, a lot of us in here have kids that are athletes. Mm -hmm. And there is this craze of being one sport, a trick, one sport athlete. Just mm -hmm. be hyper-focused, get a personal trainer, and just go to work, and you're going to be the next Antonio Gates. Clearly, one sport wasn't the road that you went down. But how do you feel about that? It's become vogue mm -hmm. in high school and even younger than that to just have one focus and only be there. I, I, you know, I'm not an advocate. Of, I don't like that personally. Um, I was more. I was. I ran track. I played football. I played basketball. I mean, we we did it all. But you know, nowadays the generation, everything has changed. Uh, it's safe to say that they have more to offer for these younger generations than they did for us. Uh, you know, I I encourage sports. I encourage more than one, so you can get an idea what you love. Get an idea what you know. What I mean, like my kids, they in the martial arts, they in the soccer, they they doing everything, so they get an idea what they like. You know, to me, that's it serves you a better purpose to be more well rounded, so you can never feel uncomfortable in certain spaces. Uh, but that's my opinion. I, I don't, you know, I don't believe one sport. You focus on that one sport because I'm doing Plan B. 
So it was a lot of people probably doing plan, you know. So it wasn't plan A that got me over the hump. It was plan B. Had I not played football, I would never had another option. And I think that's why I would never say do one sport. You've been around a lot of unique leaders, whether it's Philip Rivers, mm -hmm. Drew Brees, a bunch of different coaches. Is there a red thread that goes through some of the people that have guided your career? I have so many. I, I, I mean, it, you know, it's a guy named Steven Alexander who was a tight end before me. I actually took his spot. So um, he was a big man. He probably don't even know this to this day. This was 2002, by the way. So that was 17 years ago. So he don't even notice this day. He was so professional. Like everything he did, the way he rode, the way he dressed, the way he, he went about his way, you know, went about his business was so first class. Uh, he didn't have the talent. So that was his strength. What I did was I actually was a raw talent, but I copied everything that he did. That way he was, you know, I watched the way he dressed. I watched the way he, his mannerisms was, yes, sir, no, sir. I watched the way he practiced. I watched the way he took care of his body. And I used it and I applied it to my life. So he's an example of someone that impacted me, but he don't even know it. To this day, he wouldn't even know that. He would see me and probably walk past, probably think I'm too big. To say. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? But he was a big influence on me because I respected what he did every single day, knowing that a guy that was a rookie, you know, starting in front of him, uh, he – he was first class, and so um, I got so many people, man. I can countless of names. We see, you know, we're in a different era now, right? It's about your brand. It's about your followers. It's about you know, taking you into your life first versus maybe the team's success second. And I get all that. Like, it's mm -hmm. going to help you and your families. And I see it with athletes in high school, college, and, and clearly in the National Football League. H how do you talk to rookies? when they come in and it is this iPhone generation. All of them grew up with an iPhone. We, we didn't. We didn't have a phone probably until we were in college. And, and make sure that they subscribe to some of the values that you've learned from some of those mentors. Well, it's a two-way street nowadays, in my opinion, uh, because, you know, they say, it's a saying they say you're too young to know everything, but you're too old to know everything, too. I, you, I, really, you, I was one of those players that was fortunate to be in the transition of no social media, to a whole bunch of social media. So I watched guys who had success with no social media, and I watched guys who had success with social media. So what I try to do is I try to give them a balance. I think everything is about a balance. Uh, to me, it's like, look, you know, that's fine. You can take your pictures and do your snap. And they always snap at me. They call me OG all the time. So they snap me a lot. And I say, look, but don't lose your focus on why you're here because then you get caught up in too much social media, then you forget that you still got to play the game of football. So I just give them a balance, man. I think everything is about a balance. How you eat, how you train, how you do everything, how you party, everything you do is about a balance, in my opinion. Curious for you, you've had so many different experiences. What sparks the most joy for you? Man, happiness is puts like smiles on other people's faces for the most part. Like a lot of my homeboys and friends that I grew up with, um, you know, to see them happy, to see my family happy. Uh, I think I'm at a point now in my life where I've experienced a lot, where I, uh, my joy comes from other people's joy in a weird kind of way. It does. I, I, I love Christmas time. I love to say, here you go, this is for you, and watch someone light up. Because for me, I'm not, you know, you know like what made me happy, my, you know, I had like a, a money clip I got for Christmas. That was like one of my favorite gifts. So, it, you know, I'm not easily excited for things for me. I'm more excited for someone else's happiness or someone, someone else's excitement. To me, that was, that's what drives me now at this point. Curious. We started this conversation talking about your wonderment back mm -hmm. in Detroit. Did you ever lay up there and wonder, it'd be cool to live in L.A. one day and play football? Yeah. yeah. No, 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 I never really wondered that. I was in San Diego. <laughs> I love San Diego, man. But, you know, it was cool because we, we never really got our just due. Because of the market, I, which is in a crazy kind of way. I'm so excited for the team and the idea now, the guys being able to expand because of the this, this city, this great city in Los Angeles. Uh, but we did some phenomenal things in San Diego, and it was kind of swept under the rug because of the market. And which, had we been here, uh, you know what I mean, we'd be talked about for, you know, centuries. So uh, I'm happy that they made that transition, and I'm happy that they're given, you know, getting you know, the attention that they deserve.
you've been a part of many transitions, mm -hmm. multiple colleges, multiple sports. Transitioning into LA, it doesn't get any bigger than that. What, were there times, and if there were, what were they, when you were surprised? You were like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't expect this from Los Angeles. I think the welcoming when, when we got here, because, you know, like I said, I've been playing since 02, so, I, you know, we, I felt like we was going to be like the stepchild out here, man, all these Raider fans and Ram fans. And then our first training camp, it was it was pretty impressive to see the city kind of rally behind us in a, in a way where they supported us. And I think that was, uh, to me, I was like, wow, uh, you know, I'm impressed, it, you know. No matter what they say about L.A. and San Diego, y'all good to me. <laughs> so it, it was good, man. I think that's beautiful. I've lived in L.A. for almost 15 years now. There's probably majority of us are transplants to a large degree. But I think this city opens people up with, or welcomes people with open arms. For you, did you feel that, even only playing here for a couple seasons? Well, well I did because well, for me, I, I just always felt like this was, you know, the Raiders fan base. So, uh, and they were well aware of my name and you know what I'm saying? So for me, it was, it was, uh, it was phenomenal, like phenomenal because, uh, I just didn't think that they would welcome me the, the way that they did. When I say me, because me and Philip was the, the longest tenures on the team, everybody else was fairly new. So, uh, when we got here, it was just, you know, the love was just unbelievable. And I, I was happy that we, you know, we ended up coming. So, we got to ask. You alluded to it a few times. <laughs> Doesn't seem like you're ready to sit back and look at your highlights, even yeah, though we got to look yeah, at a couple of them yeah. tonight. Well, where do you stand right now, and, and how do you deal with it? Because you seem just at, at a, a beautifully at peace right mm -hmm. now with where you are in your career. Uh, you know, it's, you know, the, the process is what kills me when I have to think about the process because I, I said to someone earlier, uh, cause you have like, like levels of everything you do, you know, for my level, it was 6 AM to 6 PM, you know, going to sleep at eight, uh, you know, mentally I had to continue to get to that point. Uh, so I think, you know, right now I'm at peace because I, you know, I put so much work and time over a course of 16 years and now I'm just like, you know, if I go back, I would definitely make that choice in September. I'm not going through training camps. I'm not, because once I go back, I get back into a certain mind frame of just continuing to, you know, work hard and apply myself correctly. And if I can't do that, I would rather not do it, you know. So that's the dilemma with me. If I can't apply myself at a point which I know I can have success, which I've been doing for the last 16 years, any inkling comes up where I want to move or I think about something else, then I'm in the, that sport is not no game. You can get hurt really fast, you know. So I'm just at that point in my life now where I'm just, uh, I'll probably make that choice in September after training camp. You referenced, you've you played for a long time. Mm -hmm. What do you know for sure about this game? Continuity, um, sacrifice. I mean, there's a ton of things that we, I try to implement because I've been the captain for a while. Um, the trust. I mean, those are things that you can apply in any situation. Continuity, sacrifice, trust. Uh, you know, that's what this game gives you. And I think in business, it's probably the same thing. Uh, you know, to be successful is a collective effort. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a chemistry, finding the right chemistry of people uh, to work together towards a, a main goal, common goal, to, uh, you know, to have success. It ain't one being at a high level and another being at a low level. It's all of us, you know, being, you know, at a level which we work together very well. If you had to finish the sentence, it all comes down to? Uh, trust. Trust. Trusting that you're going to do the right thing. Trusting that you made the sacrifice, you made the commitment that I've made. Um, yeah, Trust. I love that. I mean, we apply that to, to every element of our life. So before I let you go, last question. I'm curious. What is it now in your life? You've been so committed to play, to sport, whatever craft it may have been over the last 20 plus years now, mm -hmm. college and the pros. What is it that you're seeking? Uh, 
I think for the most part, everybody wants to have a peace of mind for the most part. I think that's what I mean by that is, you know, just being at a, at a space where you're very comfortable. You, 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 you know, you're not worried about uh, finances. You're not worried about, you know, traveling. You're not worried about nothing. You just add a peace of mind, happiness. I mean, I think those are the two things that you sum up. And the reason why I say those things is because, uh, you know, when you're not doing something that you've been accustomed to doing, sometimes you can get unhappy really fast. And I think I hear that a lot from guys uh, who retire and they get to a point where they're not playing sports or they're not with the team or they don't have that camaraderie, uh, you know, then they they get real unhappy. And I, I to me, that's what I, I seek the most is, you know, happiness, you know, peace of mind. Because ultimately that's what we have when we play. You know, when you see us jumping around and we're making plays, that's all joy and happiness. And I think you can somehow find it, but it's just hard for us because we are used to the, you know, dopamines from getting from playing football or like no other man and it's just you know hopefully i get it in some other aspect of my life there is this great study that i'll leave you guys with uh tcu just came out with it that if you do anything 400 times or plus you begin to connect synapses in your brain you begin the road to mastery mm -hmm. but if you do it with joy and with play it only takes 10 to 20 reps wow. Wow. not wow. surprised you've had the career you've had my man appreciate it man yeah Give it up Ladies and gentlemen, Gates. the greatest tight end of all time, Antonio Gates. So we actually have our friends at JPMC and Rick allow us to ask a question. I'm wondering what your vision for the future is. I know you're currently still in your race, but the vision for the future to give back um, in terms of really anything, giving back to the younger generation. Um, yeah, where do you stand on that? Well, I... Uh, I've been a part of uh, Detroit for a while, about 10 plus years, and uh, I've always felt it was important. Uh, just, uh, you know, it's always important to see someone who has success that you can identify with. To me, that's very important for, for young kids. So I've always got back to Detroit to say, look, I'm really from here. I'm from the same environment. Uh, you know, it can happen. Uh, because so many kids and so many younger generations, they see things on TV that's, you know, it's all the bad things that they see. They don't see the good ones. You know, they hear about the bad ones. They hear about this, but they don't really see all the ones that actually did the right things and made the right choices. So I think that's why you have to give back because you want those kids to be able to identify with certain things in a positive light. All right, one last one because my wife would kill me if I didn't ask it. Uh, <laughs> as Charger fans, what's your favorite Philip Rivers story? Oh man, shoot! You talking about God I've been with for forever, man? Shoot, yeah. Doggone it! He, this dude is so fiery, man. Like, you, you, yeah, yeah. But he's the best dude in the world. So he is so competitive. I'm trying to think of. I got so many. I'm trying to think of the best. First one, one right now. What's what comes to your head? I mean, so I, one, I remember one game. I, I want to say we were playing against uh, the Raiders, and uh, this was when they had uh, a, a huge uh, Big Williams. This is 2008 or nine, and Philip arguing with the guy, and I got a block to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm like Philip, so I turn to Philip. I'm like, shut up, because you ain't gonna do nothing. I, I got a fight to do. You, you up here arguing, cussing him out every second, but we the ones. And they just killing, like, me, Chris Dillman and Marcus McNeil. And we got to block these big 400, 300-pound line Raiders back then. They would have these big linemen. And, and Philip be jawing at them. And I'm like, dude, would you please be quiet? Because we the ones that's dealing with the other end, you know. And that's kind of the, the staple of how he would do. He'd get, he'd get our defense going back when Merriman was playing. And he'd start making them mad. And I'm like, Philip. I know, you know, you want to trash talk, but look, dude, why don't you get down here and block him then? So, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how he does. Every game, he's doing all the talking, and I got to be the one to catch the ball and take a hit from that dude. So, you know, let's switch spots and see how much stuff you talk then. <laughs> so he's a good dude, man. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest tight end in the history of the NFL. Antonio Gates.